recording. No, thank you very much. Um, so hi everyone, and thank you, uh, thank all of you for joining us for another session of uh, the Women in Network Science. Um, so for today, we have a very exciting format for you, um, which is a new format we just added to the um, seminar um, um, a year ago, uh, and it's the Pathways in Network Science. Um, so in this format, we basically would um, hope to um, plan and provide a platform for um, accomplished women in network science to share their career journeys and uh, relevant uh, aspects of their um, career and also personal life. Um, so it's really flexible. Um, basically, we hope to um, give the um, speaker the freedom to talk about whatever they think is really important to them and what they think will be very um, helpful to all the uh, early career stage um, women and um, uh, um, all the people who um, are currently pursuing academia. Um, so uh, for today, our speaker is, um, you know, if I pronounce the name wrong. Yota, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, um, so um, Yoda, um, she started out as a the youngest um, PI at the IMBB fourth um, in Greece in two thousand two. So she joined IMBB with less than two years of postdoc experience in Greece, where she moved upon completion of her graduate study in the U.S. at University of Southern California, Los Angeles, um, between nineteen ninety six and two thousand. So then she was promoted to associate researcher uh, in 2008, and in 2014, she became a research director, uh, which is equivalent to full professor. Um, that is a position that she holds until today. Um, she leads the dendrites lab at IMBB Fourth, which whose mission is to unravel the role of dendrites in complex brain functions. Her lab is one of the very handful, um, one of the a handful in Greece that really uses computational modeling approaches to study brain function and develop neuro inspired artificial intelligence methods. Uh, and in the last few years, she has expanded her research activity to include behavior and in vivo in, in, imaging experiments in mice. So um, that's um, uh, kind of like a history of uh, what Yoda has been doing. And I just want to add a personal note to it uh, is every, um, I actually first um, get to know Yoda through a fence meeting and that by then I already kind of get to know like she's a really warm hearted person and um, really does really amazing research. And then I met her at the GRC um, conference and uh, I sort of got to know her a little bit more personally as well and uh she's just really wonderful person and i am really excited to hear about her experience today so yeah with that uh, i will just hand it over to you and uh, i will stop talking now <laughs> thank you so much you it's it's great to be here thank you for the beautiful introduction i hope you find what i have to say useful let's see um, I just wanted to say, feel free to uh, interrupt me and ask uh, questions during the talk. I find it more engaging and fun if people ask questions. Um, so feel free to do that. Use the chat as well, whatever is more convenient to you. Okay. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, so as Johan said, I am based in Crete. Crete is a Greek island in the Mediterranean. It's beautiful. You're all uh, invited to visit. In fact, we, I would start with an advertisement. We will have the fourth dendrites meeting in Crete uh, coming up in May 2024. And it's a really nice and exciting meeting for those interested in dendrites. So you're very welcome to join and we get to know each other from uh, uh, in person. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, my personal path to science and, um, and a few things about women in science in general. So I wanted to start with this slide, which I found uh, in the uh, website of the Royal Society. And I think it's really nice. Of course, you are all advanced in your careers. So maybe you don't need to know that. This slide is about science. Why is it important? 
and why it is also so much fun to do science. I think it's kind of our responsibility, everyone's responsibility to be able to advocate in favor of science to younger people. So I'm presenting this to you so that then you go on and tell these things to your uh, friends and children and nieces and whoever may want to consider a career in science. So science is really important because it gives us uh, the opportunity to improve our quality of life through multiple new discoveries. We can, for example, develop new drugs and therapies to treat the diseases. We can come up with new technologies to help climate change, for example, so through technologies that have to do with renewable energy or AI, which is very prominent and uh, very sexy nowadays. All these things come from different scientific careers. But uh, for me personally, and probably for many of you, it's also a lot of fun to be doing science. It, there is a special kind of thrill in uh, new discoveries and inventions that makes our lives more exciting uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Science is a lot about creativity, collaboration, and spending fun time together and transferring the new knowledge to the next generation or to other people that are interested about science. And most of the times we do that through mentoring, like you already mentioned that you are organizing a mentoring program. There are many such mentoring programs out there to spread the beauty of science to a bigger audience. Now, women in science, why is it really important to have women? And I would not only say women, but diversity in general in science. Well, first of all, it is our right. It is in fact, everybody's right to be doing research um, irrespectively of their sex, gender identity, uh, disability, age, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, race, nationality, religion, or culture. There is no reason why people from this variable background should not be doing science. And in fact, if you look at the website of the ALBA network, I don't know if you know the ALBA network, if not, please Google it. It's a very, very active community promoting equality and diversity in science. And they have a lot of activities out there, including some uh, really serious mentorship and sharing of resources. Uh, and they are a very strong advocate for diversity in science. And I encourage you all to become a member of ALBA. They also have the ALBA declaration. Many people have signed that, including institutions, where they specify what actions they will take, measurable actions, to increase the participation of women uh, and, and diverse uh, people in uh, science. So it is our undeniable right. The other very important reason is that women and the diverse populations in general have different needs and different ways of thinking or communicating these needs, which often leads to fresh ideas and more creativity, especially when working in teams. This is particularly important for science because in science is a teamwork endeavor, right? So if you have people that have that see the same problem, let's say from different view viewpoints and share these viewpoints, and we have a much higher likelihood of succeeding at whatever it is that we're trying to solve, whatever scientific question we have in mind. So it is really important to have diverse opinions in science. And there are, because of these differences in physiology and psychology of men and women, which are often neglected in science, there are many new therapies and drugs that are not really suited for the entire population. Like, for example, it is well known that um, some of the devices that screen for um, uh, insulin levels or sugar levels, glucose levels in the blood, they work very well in uh, people with white skin, but not as well in people with dark skin. And this is most probably because these people were not included in clinical trials. So this is just one example why diversity is important. Similarly for women, we have a very different, let's say hormonal background than men. So if this is not taken into account in a number of, of treatments, this may uh, turn out to be inefficient. So it is important to consider diversity for reasons like this, um, drug discovery and treatment discovery. And of course, the most important reason is that most of the scientific fields, but especially those that have to do with STEM are heavily male dominated. And you know, why should this be the case? Women are equally good in mastering STEM skills. So there's uh, 
a need to change this uh, inequality. These are just some of statistics to take a look at the current situation. Actually, this slide is from 2011 to 2015, so it's rather old, but I've taken a look at more recent data as well, which I will present next. And as you can see, across the world, the percentage of women in science doing research in the engineering field is between 22 to 30%. Brazil, I think, is the highest percent, was the highest percent in 2015. However, there has been an important improvement over the years. If you look at the numbers in parentheses, those are from 96 to 2000, and they are significantly lower. Back then, the percentage was in the order of 10 to 15 percent. Now it's in the order of 20 to 33 percent. Portugal is actually the best in this slide. And more recent data, just from a few countries uh, in Europe, you can see that there are a few countries that have a very high percentage, almost as high as 50%, like Latvia and Lithuania, but the majority of the European countries are significantly lower than that. And the average at the European Union in 2022 is 32.9% women compared to men. And this is researchers, right? The total percentage of researchers um, that are doing science in Europe. So we still have a long way to go until full equality, which would be uh, 50%. Now, why is this the case? Well, there are a number of reasons. Uh, and here I just have an uh, example slide that lists different kinds of obstacles that women in science face. Gender bias is of course a very important one, uh, you, which you can see uh, at the top here. But there is also lack of information and awareness. Not many people know these statistics, these numbers, especially young uh, women when they enter the scientific field. And it is our job, as I said before, to increase awareness about this important issue. So lack of information and awareness is another really important reason. Lack of representation. So we don't have enough women advocating for the participation of women in science. And advocacy is very important and lack of support, support from colleagues, which may be uh, you know, not considering the, the um, obstacles that women face in their career as a scientist, from family, from society, from government. Um, there are many um, sources, let's say, of support that we can have in, this, uh, in our scientific uh, endeavors which are not ideal. Of course, many of these problems are solved in some countries uh, where they do have, let's say, um, gender equality plans. They have active programs uh, for awareness and in information, but the majority of the countries are still lagging uh, behind. And uh, you can find a nice, uh, a couple of nice publications about these issues that I listed here, recent ones. Uh, where gender bias in academia, for example, is discussed, um, or women that are systematically underrepresented as first and last author in publications. If you're interested, you can take a closer look. So these are general informations about, uh, information about uh, the problems that women face um, in their scientific careers. Now, there are many things one can do. I'm just listing a few here. Um, increased awareness through events like the one that we're having now and many more. Uh, you can look at the ALBA network where they have a lot of activities for awareness and mentoring. There is now a very strong uh, push at the European level to come up uh, with gender equality plans and committees. In fact, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Horizon Europe, the new framework program, will not give out uh, funds to institutions that do not have a gender equality plan. So now every institution is forced to develop one which is, let's say, a great thing. They should have had it in the first place, but now they have a much stronger reason to come up with a gender equality plan. I know our institution has developed one precisely for this reason. There is also a lot of training material to increase awareness and ways to deal with obstacles. You can find a lot of courses, uh, slides, uh, podcasts in LinkedIn. Uh, there's a very nice learning course club uh, that has several uh, short courses about um, awareness, Pro the Royal Society that I mentioned earlier, earlier, and of course, ALBA. 
And one important uh, aspect that these gender equality plans are now uh, considering is to come up with a new set of evaluation criteria for scientists. And this is especially important both for postdocs and young PIs, because there are things that we consider, let's say, self-evident that are not yet taken into consideration where, when we're evalu evaluated uh, for promotion or for tenure. And this include motherhood. And by motherhood, I'm not just saying the time taken off for maternity leave, but also the amount of time that can be realistically dedicated to research if you have small children. Because even if you're not on maternity leave, you have to pick them up from uh, daycare. You have to take them to responsibilities. Uh, women have to make sure they have dinner. There are a lot of things that have to be done when uh, women have children, and this should be considered in, as an, uh, into the evaluation criteria, as I said, for scientists. And then, of course, all the explicit leaves that are taken, including maternity and sick leaves and parenthood leaves, um, and so on and so forth. And most importantly, for some places more than others, is to have su support at work uh, by their employers of the state, like, for example, to have childcare on site, to have financial support for childcare, for attending conferences, and many more. And many of these things are already in place in the US, I remember when I was in the US, there was already childcare and financial support for childcare in the university. But many European countries are still suffering, especially the Eastern European ones. So I'm very glad to see that there is a lot of ongoing effort to address these problems. Now, this was just a short introduction in general about women in science. And now I want to tell you my own story, how I started and how I got to the position that I am today. As I said, feel free to stop me and ask questions. I mean, if you have already questions about the first part, um, you know, I'm happy to take any. Um, I don't have a question, but if anybody is in, um, interested in the Alba Network and also the Dendra meeting, we can send it out in our newsletter as well. Always Wonderful. Work. Thanks. OK, so how did my path to science start? Now I'm revealing my age, but I think it was an important year. I was born in 1974. I was born in a small island in the Mediterranean. This is Cyprus. Probably many of you may never have heard of it. Um, it is between uh, Turkey and Egypt in a very important uh, geographical location um, because it is at the crossroad of Asia, um, uh, Europe, and Africa. So because of its geopolitical uh, um, importance, in 1974, Cyprus, which is predominantly a Greek island, although a mixed population with both Greek origin and Turkish origin people, um, was invaded in 1974 by Turkey, and about two thirds of the islands were occupied. And this is when I was born. So I was six days old when the invasion took uh, place. I was at the occupied part of the island. So my parents had to flee and become refugees in their own country. I was literally carried over in a little basket I'm not the, the baby in the photo, but that's how they carried me as well. Um, and the early uh, childhood years were very challenging for me because we had to move around from cities. My father had to leave the country to get a, you know, a job to support his family. So it was just me and my mom for a few years growing up in a very, let's say, challenging situation. This for me was... Uh, a very strong motivation to try to find a way that I would have a better quality of life. And I thought that, uh, you know, school, let's say training, science, the skills that I could get um, by training were a ticket, let's say, to a better quality of life. And I think this feeling is uh, uh, very popular among uh, refugees still nowadays. Uh, and I can attest to that, that it is an, an important reason for going, let's say, into science. So then I move uh, fast forward uh, 18 years into my um, training travels. 
I started in Cyprus, where I attended, I attended the University of Cyprus in 1992 uh, to get a bachelor in mathematics. I was super lucky because that was the first year that the University of Cyprus was funded. Before that, we did not have a university. And in fact, I wanted to study medicine or biology because I was really fascinated about the brain from very early on. But um, my family was not very supportive of me leaving the island because I had to go to mainland Greece or another country to study medicine as the newly founded university did not have a medical school. So for reasons that had to do with my dad being old fashioned and wanted his daughter to just get married and have, it, to have uh, children uh, and a combination of their inability to support me financially because we were refugees and we did not have a, um, a big fortune, right? Um, I decided to stay in the island and study mathematics instead. Now, mathematics was my second uh, big, uh, let's say, uh, love among all the different courses that I studied at high school. So it was a nice choice for me, and I had a lot of fun studying mathematics at the University of Cyprus. What was really interesting at the time was that because the university was very new, it was just funded, they had classes of just 30 people, and we were their guinea pigs because they were experimenting on us with a, a curriculum. And we were just 28 women in the class plus two men. So it was a heavily female dominated class. And the reason was that the boys had to go to the army first. So in Cyprus, it is mandatory to do the um, army service at 18 for two years before they can go to university. That's why we were you know, 20 way, 28 women and two men in my math class, which is something super unusual. You don't find that uh, uh, easily anywhere else. So no problem with uh, underrepresentation in my undergrad years. In fact, it was quite the opposite. It was hard to find uh, uh, some interesting uh, men in those years. So I did a four years degree in mathematics, which was great. I really loved math. But I felt that they are too theoretical and I wanted to do something that was closer to biology and closer to uh, dealing with uh, the human body. So I looked into options for doing a master's and a PhD in something that would get me back on track uh, to medicine. So the way to get back towards medicine was through biomedical engineering. So I applied to a lot of schools in the US, exclusively in the US, because I knew that in the US I could get a, a fellowship. Without a fellowship, I could not go because as I said, we did not have the funds. So I applied to multiple schools. And uh, because I was top of my class, uh, when I graduated and I had great grades and uh, excellent references, it was not very difficult to get offers. I got quite a few offers from really great universities. And initially I wanted to go to Stanford but they wouldn't give me a fellowship for the first year, so that was not possible. And instead, I went to Los Angeles and attended the University of Southern California, where they gave me a four-year uh, full uh, fellowship, scholarship, and I did a master's in the first two years, combined with a PhD uh, in the next four years. So by four years, um, I was done with my PhD. That was in the uh, University of Southern California. And then um, I decided to come back to Europe. I decided to come back to Europe for personal reasons. While I was doing my uh, PhD, I met uh, my future husband and uh, we had a great two years together, but then he returned to Greece. So I had to stay for two years uh, in Los Angeles to finish my degree and then I returned back um, in 2000 to find him, to meet with him. So two, four years later, I was back in Greece, where I was first as a postdoc in Athens at um, the Alexander Fleming Foundation for uh, two years. And then I was lucky enough to get a position as a researcher in Crete, where I am located now in IMB, the Institute of Molecular Biology and Biology.
than biotechnology at fourth. So this is, let's say, my uh, my path uh, uh, in one slide. Now, in my postdoc years, which were at the uh, biomedical uh, research center of Alexander Fleming in Athens, I had to do something completely different. There was no computational neuroscience in the country at the time. So I returned following my husband and I was jobless for the first six months. And then I decided, you know, I can't just stay at home so I can do something else. And they were looking for bioinformaticians. So people that had good math skills and they could use them to analyze data. So I applied and they hired me as a postdoc to do bioinformatics. This was kind of interesting because I uh, put, let's say my mathematical skills in good use. So the mathematical degree came in handy. Although I could not study uh, what I had learned in my PhD, which, which was um, in fact computational neuroscience. That's where I learned to simulate the brain. It was under a degree in biomedical engineering, but essentially it was computational neuroscience. So for the first uh, two years, I was doing bioinformatics. I learned how to build artificial neural networks to analyze RNA data. And it was interesting and fun. Not ideal, but it was a good experience. And then I moved on uh, to the institute where I am today. I was elected in 2002 in a researcher position, but since I had uh, money from a Marie Curie uh, fellowship, I stayed as a postdoc for another year, and I officially became a PI in 2004, where I am running my lab, um, which is called uh, the Dendrites Lab. One of the things that I wanted to get across in today's seminar was that science and family, uh, at least for me, they were um, parallel streams. Everything was done in parallel. And I, I would like to send out this message as well, that there is no reason for not having a family when you are doing science. Everything is possible. I just want to share my experience and you know, little tricks that I learned along the way. So I started my PhD in 1996 at the University of Southern California. And at the same time, I met my future husband. Um, I was a PhD student. He had finished his PhD and he was working at the engineering department at the time. We fell in love. We have a wonderful, uh, as I said, two years together. And then he returned to Greece and I had to work full time for another two years to get my PhD. While I was still a PhD candidate, we got married in 1999 in Greece. It was not easy being apart, um, but I guess many people have long, long range uh, um, uh, relationships nowadays. And, you know, we were talking on a regular basis and, um, you know, he left in 1998, we got married in 1999. In 2000, I returned to Greece uh, to be with him and he went to the army. So there was another, let's say one year that we were still apart because he had to do his mandatory army. So things were not much different uh, compared to when I was in the US, but at least we were in the same country and we could get to see each other more easily. And back then there was no FaceTime. In fact, I think Skype, was invented around 1999 because that was when we started having uh, uh, video calls and seeing each other, which was you know nothing compared to nowadays when it's <laughs> it's much easier for people to see each other and be closer. Uh, you know it was tough back then. We just call each other on a regular phone and you know not every day because it was super expensive. Now things are much easier, I think, in terms of long distance relationships. So he was in the army. He did uh, 18 months in the army. I was actually pretty uh, mad at him for uh, not being uh, with me uh, all the way. I gave up my future in the US and returned. Uh, but two years later, uh, I was elected in my uh, researcher position in Crete. And he also got a position at the University of Crete. So we were finally together. So we essentially moved into an apartment together 
and started a job. We were really fortunate at the time because we were, we are still in the same city and the same research center. So there is fourth is a research center and the University of Crete is a different institution, but they are next to each other in a distance of less than a kilometer. So we are physically in the same um, extended area, same campus. In 2003, when I was a researcher C, so a non-tenure track, but non-tenure yet, I had my first child. People said that it was a silly thing to do because I should have waited and have a tenure before risking my career to have a family that would take a lot of time away. It was uh, challenging indeed with no uh, family and parents in Crete to support us. Uh, but it was um, an excellent decision, I think. Uh, it was a lovely uh, little boy, so um, I could manage to, to do science and also have uh, an extended family in 2003. It was so good that two years later I had a second child, two boys. Um, that was even more demanding because having kids at home and uh, spending time in the lab was not easy. I was very lucky because my hus husband is also a professor at the University of Crete. That's why we're in the same city and in the same institution and we share the responsibility. So we could uh, you know, take care of the kids on alternate days. He would uh, share uh, household responsibilities, cooking, uh, taking them to activities and so on and so forth. Um, and it worked out well, it wasn't easy, but it worked out well. We had to be highly organized, both at home and in the lab to make the maximum of the time we had, uh, because a key element for having both a family and a scientific career, I think, is efficiency. You have to uh, be very focused uh, when at work to get the maximum productivity so that you don't have to work as much from home and devote more family and more time to uh, family and children. In 2010, we had a third child, my daughter. Um, she has, a, there was a bigger gap there. So it gave us some time to, um, you know, adjust uh, to all the things that we had to do with kids. So then we decided three was enough. And then, uh, you know, a few years later, we even adopted a dog and a few cats. The number of cats has expanded exponentially since then. We have about eight now, I think, uh, big family. Uh, but what I can say is that it is uh, very relaxing to come home uh, to a big family uh, of both uh, children, little humans and uh, animals. So in my experience, Science and family can work out very well. They can work out in harmony and you don't have to wait to get a permanent position before starting to have a family. I actually think it would be even harder uh, if someone did that for many um, reasons. And of course there is my lab, which is my second family. This is the current composition of the lab. Both uh, women and men were trying our best to have a, a balanced uh, lab here, although it is not easy because the main subject of the lab is computational neuroscience, which means building computational models. And unfortunately, there are still not that many women who want to do that. Uh, I think they are scared. They are worried that they may not be able to uh, make it as uh, excellent programmers or they are feared of the math behind the modeling. Um, but it's definitely not the case. I am 100% uh, convinced by now that uh, women and men are equally competent in doing everything and uh, gender is no uh, reason for selecting a particular discipline. You may not enjoy it as much, this is a different thing, but in terms of competences, you know, Everyone can be an expert as long as they want it badly enough and devote enough time. So in my lab, we actively try to have both uh, male and female researchers working on both modeling and uh, the experiments that we started recently doing. So what do we do in my lab? Well, we are interested in the brain. 
We are interested in how neurons process information. This is a granule cell in the hippocampus. You can see that it consists of dendrites and spines where information is delivered from one cell to the other. And um, our primary focus is essentially to develop such computational models of the brain uh, using math and programming and to study many different questions. The questions that we are primarily interested in have to do with learning and memory formation. Um, and we have a lot of different uh, projects. For example, I, I have not uh, included a large scientific part in this talk. If you want, you can feel free to uh, ask me. Uh, but we have projects where we build models in many different brain areas, like the hippocampus, the frontal cortex, the amygdala. We simulate what happens um, in, uh, in dendrites, if this is the hippocampus, for example, and we are primarily interested in dendrites. In, in uh, granules, says these are the dendrites that we can see here. They are furnished with many different ionic properties. We focus on how signal transmission takes place through synapses, how it's integrated at the dendritic level, and how these signals, these electrical signals, are propagated from one neuron to the other to underlie complex behaviors. Uh, as I said, we focus on dendrites, which are these elaborated structures that we can see here from many different um, neuron types. They were first described by Ramon Itaha back in the 1800s, and there is a great variety uh, of their morphology and um, biophysical properties. And one of the reasons that I was fascinated about dendrites is because if you try to imagine your brain, the human brain, without dendrites, then it would be 66 times at least bigger because dendrites provide a very large surface area um, that neurons can use to connect and uh, transfer information. And if you were to replace the surface area with cell bodies, it would occupy a much larger volume. So I find it fascinating that um, evolution figured out a way to solve this problem, the, problems, the problem of maximizing information transfer while fitting the structure into a small skull. And dendrites is one solution to this problem. Another reason where we are fascinated about dendrites is because they correlate with our cognitive abilities. This is a figure of the dendritic morphology across different ages from humans. From the age of one year old until the age of 80 years old, um, including uh, healthy elderly people and uh, uh, Alzheimer's uh, with the people with dementia. And you can see that in uh, the beginning, in one year old babies, there is a relatively simple dendritic structure. And as the babies grow older and older, so does the complexity of the dendritic tree. And there is the peak of the dendritic complexity is seen around the peak of cognitive ability, so between 30 and 60 years old. And then together with cognitive decline, there is also morphological atrophy. So there is a correlation between the dendritic morphology and cognitive abilities, which suggests that dendrites are very important uh, for, uh, for these uh, cognitive abilities. So that's one another reason why we are interested in understanding their uh, computations. Now, how do we address this question? We addressed it, as I said, mostly using computational methods because this was my main uh, background. So we built uh, models in the computer. There are a lot of benefits of using a computational approach. It's faster, it's cheaper, it requires less manual effort. And once we have these models, then we can generate a number of uh, predictions that make the life of an experimentalist easier because they provide predictions that can then lead to new discoveries. And there is also another important reason for using models because often in, uh, in experiments, you have pieces of information that comes in into small fragments and it's very hard to see a big, bigger picture, but in a model, you can synthesize this information and create a more high level concepts. 
So that's a, a good reason for selective, uh, uh, for using computational models. I have an example of sub, such a computational model here. This is an, a network that we built in the lab that is used to store memories. You can see the simplified neurons here, the cell body, the dendrites, the little dots are synapses. They have two colors. The yellow are supposed to represent one memory. The blue are supposed to represent another memory. They randomly happen to occur into common dendrites. And when the subject, you know, the mouse presumably, is learning a new memory, there is strengthening of synaptic inputs that you can see by growing these uh, yellow balls. This would be the synapses. And once these synapses grow in size, they make the dendrite much more excitable. So it is easier for these dendrites to fire when these new inputs start coming in. And as a result of this increased excitability, you can also have inputs from the second memory growing nearby to the previous ones, forming small clusters of synapses that correspond to two memories. When this happens, if the animal, the model in this case, tries to recall the first memory, it will also drive uh, excitability in the neighboring synapses, and therefore it will be more likely to also recall the second memory. So we proposed that with this model, um, the mouse can associate, it, associate two pieces of information of two different uh, memories together uh, by storing them into the same dendrites. You have several papers coming out on this theme. Um, may, this work was done a lot in collaboration with the lab of Arsino Silva. Um, if you're interested, I can share some of our publications. The main, let's say, power of this modeling work, of this modeling work was that we can have a network model that can explain at the subcellular level by simulating processes that take place at the subcellular level can explain uh, behavioral experiments that are done in mice. They were done in the lab of Arsino Silva, where they show this binding of information between uh, neighboring memories. Okay. So in addition to do um, uh, a training in theoretical neuroscience, I also had the opportunity, and I'm super grateful for this, to get some training in, in experiments. I did a sabbatical in the lab of Alcino Silva in 2007 until 2008, where I learned how to patch neurons. It was very cool, very interesting, very difficult. Um, I found it extremely tedious, I have to say. I patched uh, my first neuron with a glass pipette after many failures. I was super excited to see the neuron going uh, off, I mean, firing. So it was a unique experience to, let's say, see in real life what I could predict with my models. But after doing it a few times, I felt that it was too much work uh, for the excitement that I got the first time. So I figured, okay, maybe I should go back to my modeling. <laughs> um, uh, but then a few years later, like a decade later, actually, I, I got a fellowship to visit the lab of Matthew Larkum to continue on this experimental endeavor. And there I learned to do surgeries, um, implant cranial windows, do virus injections, um, and learn how to do head fixed behavior. And this, this second time, the reason for going back into training was that I really felt the models were not enough. They were really cool about generating predictions, but they would always be predictions. And that unless we test some of these predictions experimentally, we wouldn't really know if they are true. And to do that, there were multiple ways. I still do that through a lot of collaborations and I'm very grateful for being so lucky to have excellent collaborators like Alcino and Matthew, but also many others, Attila Losonzi, Sahida Bazou, um, that I work with um, in collaboration. I still felt that are, there are some of the predictions in our model that are not of maybe of interest to these collaborators or that I really wanted to test them uh, in my lab. So I decided I would get the training and expand the lab to do experiments. So one lesson I learned from this 
um, you know, endeavoring to the experimental field was that there is another kind of bias that at least I experience, and I think many others experience as well, which I would call the expertise bias. It has been very difficult to obtain, let's say, the label of an experimentalist, or I'm actually very far from that, but you feel uh, confident that one day I can be both uh, a modeler and an experimentalist, because people think that it's hard to go into, to obtain a new expertise if you don't have, let's say, the original training. So I have a math background, I don't have a biology, but a biology background. So often I was told that I would never make it as an experimentalist and I should stick to what I know best because I have math training or because it's going to be very difficult and why should I do it? Um, you know, there is no reason if I'm already established as a theoretical person. You know, I faced some resistance in trying to gain a, a new expertise. So I would call this the expertise bias. I've discussed it with a few people and, and I was told that others feel the same. Even the other way around, if you are an experimentalist and you want to become a modeler, it's the same kind of expertise bias. It is uh, rather sad, I would say. Our field is becoming more and more interdisciplinary. And um, I think it's great if more people want to learn more techniques. Of course, collaboration is also amazing and one cannot do everything. Um, so that's an also an option. I'm not saying someone should be an expert in everything, but if you want to do it, there is no reason why you shouldn't. And there shouldn't be um, you know, a bias in these attempts either. So after getting this training, we established um, an experimental uh, field, uh, experimental branch in my lab, where we set up a two photon microscope where we can do a head fixed uh, animal behavior live and keep track of changes in activity using calcium imaging. In mice, this is our little setup here. Um, and we do, we do uh, imaging of spines as well. And we have projects where we want to look at how spine dynamics may explain uh, behaviors, online behaviors. So the project that we have right now in the lab is about behavioral flexibility. And we're looking at whether spine turnover or other kinds of spine dynamics like clustering could explain the ability of animals to learn to switch between multiple rules. So that's a scientific question we're asking right now. Things are going well, not as fast as I would like to. Uh, so it's been a, a, let's say a bumpy road, but I'm super excited that we're actually getting some results and next week we will have uh, my PhD student will present her work and uh, the first conference where we have some kind of a, a first story and it looks good. And I am thrilled that we managed to get it going. And hopefully, you know, in the not uh, very distant future, we will be able to have uh, experimentalist, uh, uh, experimental publications as well. So yeah, that's the experimental part of the lab. Um, okay, so what did I learn throughout my journey? Well, I learned that the life of the scientist is definitely not easy. There are many challenges, both at work and at home. For me, the most important challenge was to secure funding for my team. This is something that all postdocs should have in mind, that being a postdoc, you are only responsible for yourself. You have your project. Most of the times funding for a postdoc position comes from the PI. Sometimes you also need to apply for your own funding, uh, but this is, I think, not uh, the normal. Most of the times the PI supports a postdoctoral um, years. And you should cherish that because after that, it becomes really difficult and important to secure funding. That's uh, for me, the number one worry because all the people in my lab depend on me for providing their salaries. If I fail, they would be jobless. So it is a huge responsibility. And funding is not easy to secure. Right now, the success rate in the US, for example, for an R01 grant is 10% or less. It used to be 25, but now it's 10%. So it's very competitive in the US. It's also very competitive in Europe, where in some schemes is uh, 
you know, below 10%, or it could be at up to 15 or 20%. So it's not a very high chance for getting funding. And one has to apply for a lot of grants to succeed. So that for me is the most important, let's say, obstacle that we face um, on a day-to-day -day basis as scientists. The second one, which I also find super important, is uh, the press to publish, and especially the the constant pressure to publish on high impact journals. When I was a PhD student, this was not the case. I was just doing my research, talking with my PI, who was by the way, an excellent supervisor. Every day I was super excited about, you know, building my models, discovering new things. I did not even have to think about a publication. I was not even in the back of my mind. My supervisor just said, okay, you did a great job. Now we have to wrap it up and publish your work. Okay, fine, I will do a, a, I will write a paper. But I didn't really know anything about impact factors at the time. It was not a priority. Right now, most of the PhD students and postdocs, they do science and think about where they would publish because their next career tech step would be dependent on the impact of their publications. And I think it's sad because it has changed the way science should be. It kind of took out the fun in science because it's now heavily driven, driven based on success indicators. And I am a, a senior editor at eLife right now, which I don't know if you know, but has a new model where we uh, will publish uh, preprints as opposed to the classical published uh, papers. Preprints meaning that once a paper goes through a first initial screening, it will be published no matter what, no matter what the review process um, will uh, decide, right? no matter what the evaluation will be. And it's up to the authors to decide whether they want to consider the reviewer's comments and revise their manuscript and at which point they want to stop revising. And I think this is a very bold move towards changing the impact factor um, story so that people now have much more control on their publications rather than relying on the impact of the journal. And I think eLife was, let's say, very brave in doing this because it is an established journal with a high impact factor, in fact, that decided to deviate from that path with the hope that the publishing model will change. And I think the publishing model is changing. We can see that already because people are uh, putting their papers in archive and bioarchive, and they worry more about communicating their science, at least as a first step through this public platforms rather than um, keeping it, you know, um, confidential until they publish it in a high impact journal. So publish or perish is still the dominant model in a, um, science nowadays, but I think it's at the turning point and hopefully in the next few years, it will change to the better, uh, towards uh, a better model. Another important challenge that we discussed extensively is gender bias. In my personal path, I did not explicitly felt it so intensely. Maybe it was there lying in the background, but I cannot say that I experienced very strong gender bias. It is a more subtle thing. And if you're not very trained uh, at uh, you know, looking af after for it, you may never see it. Of course, I am the only female PI at the researcher director level in my uh, institute, the only one, <laughs> one woman. So this speaks uh, uh, on its own about uh, the gender bias um, in, in my institute at least. There are other women, but they are at the University of Crete and they're affiliated members. There is no other female research director in my institute. This means I am, you know, a single woman in many of the committees. And this is an Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, by the way. So it is a big problem in, country, in countries like Greece and Eastern European countries in general. And as I said, things are changing. We have these 
um, gender, uh, career, the um, diversity and gender bias plans that uh, institutes are developing. So hopefully this will also change in the next few years. The final and really important challenge that uh, I have experienced is running a lab with people because you have to manage people on a daily basis and this is not easy. Uh, is there a question? No? Okay, no. So managing people is a skill that we are not trained for. Um, when you become a PI, there are lab courses right now, especially run by Empo, for example, that teach you how to hire people, how to resolve conflict in a team, how to interview people. But this is not something that um, is part of our training. And I think it should be because it's not easy to transition from a postdoc position to a PI position and suddenly have to interact with a big team and being able to supervise them uh, correctly to mentor them in the right way or to resolve conflicts, for example. So that's another big challenge um, that um, I think is important to learn how to deal with at work. At home, there are different challenges, you know, not let's say as difficult ones like uh, housekeeping, taking care of children, that's an important uh, uh, challenge because it requires time and effort dedicating time, uh, quality time to a personal relationship with a spouse and taking time off to take care for ourselves. These are also important challenges at home. And there's typically not a lot of time left for these important activities. So one has to be very mindful that in order to be successful um, at work or at home, you know, you have to devote the necessary amount of time to both of these. And what I found really uh, important for me was to have um, uh, a spouse that had a similar profession, uh, profession as mine and therefore could understand the challenges at work and um, show, you know, share the responsibilities at home so that I could pursue my career. And I'm super grateful uh, for that. So balance, I think, is a key in, in having a successful scientific and uh, family career. As I said, in the lab, the goal is to maximize efficiency. And for me, there are different ways to do that. At home, you have to maximize quality time with family. So to maximize efficiency, I found it really important to prioritize things. So I, I first prioritize based on importance of things to get done rather than on you know, how big or small the task is, because this way you can get into a trap of dealing with the little things first and leave all the important things uh, at the end uh, and this uh, serious risk. So prioritizing is important. And for me, prioritizing based on the impact of the actions is what works best. Uh, I, I am a super organized person. I have to-do lists, calendars, uh, you know, notifications so that I don't forget things because there's so many things that one has to do as a PI. Um, so organization is critical. And recently, the past year, I also hired a lab manager. I wish I had done it earlier. Earlier, she's super helpful um, in supporting us in many ways, me, but also the entire lab. So I think it's important to have support if you can't. And the most important lesson that I have learned is to say no. Many times, uh, especially as a young PI, you are flattered by being invited in conferences, in committees, in grant proposals, and find it super difficult to say no, especially in the, if the indication comes from people um, you know, that are acquainted with or that we are friends. But it is super important to be able to say no if there is no interest or no time. Um, you know, there's always a polite say, way to say no, but it's better to say no to something if you know you cannot fit it into your schedule rather than doing a poor job at it. So uh, with respect to family, uh, what I found really important uh, take home message after these years was that devoting time um, to children and spouse is super important. And it's not really how much time you devote to them, but the quality of time. So it's not a good idea 
to be writing emails or responding to messages while, you know, uh, watching a movie with family or while you're playing games with the children. So they need undevoted attention, even for shorter time spans than um, uh, time spans where you combine work with uh, family. I would not advise, uh, I would advise against that, in fact. Distributing the workload, workload is also really important. It has worked well in our family. S is getting help from parents, spouse, nannies, whatever. These two things are really important. We cannot do everything, so we have to find ways to delegate some of these responsibilities so that there is a little time at least left uh, for ourselves. And uh, that includes going to the gym or doing uh, favorite hobbies. For me, I only go to the gym um, and enjoy some time in the morning at home before going to work or petting my cats. I find that invaluable. So um, I think that uh, it is really important to find time for that as well. So my overall philosophy is that knowledge is super uh, powerful because it is opening new avenues in both science and beyond and secures a high quality of life. So I'm a strong advocate of people pursuing a scientific career and getting as much training as possible. But then also I believe that life is short and we cannot do everything, uh, although we can do a lot if there is a will. And if there is a will, there's always a way. That's uh, an old saying, right? So I believe that family and science can coexist in harmony. And my personal experience speaks to that. A life, the life of a scientist is beautiful, creative, fun, but also super hard. And I think people should know uh, that failure is uh, more common than success in this journey. There are many barriers, uh, for example, find the funding, securing funding for their team, but also inequalities, gender inequalities, different kinds of biases. So one has to be very passionate and willing to work hard and be very persistent and patient in order to succeed, succeed in, in a scientific career. I also found it very important to be adaptive. Like for me, uh, for example, I couldn't do what I wanted to study medicine in the beginning. I had to do uh, my first degree in math. I didn't mind, I adapted to that very quickly. Similarly, when I returned and had to do bioinformatics instead of computational neuroscience, which is what I studied, that was another part where I had to adapt uh, to a new career. Uh, even when I got to this position in Crete, I first had to do bioinformatics before doing uh, uh, computational neuroscience. So adaptability, I think, was a super uh, important skill uh, for uh, getting to where I am today. And finally, I think that fortune favors the bold and opportunities are hard to find, especially in Greece, but everywhere. So you should be creating those opportunities and making the maximum out of it. And what I found rather late, which is really important, is networking and mentoring. If you are involved into a network like this or another network of young scientists, it is super important for getting feedback, but also for becoming invited to places, becoming invited to grant applications, getting advice by looking at how others do it. So networking is super critical for a scientific career. So that's all I had to uh, share with you today. Um, I wanna close with something that uh, a previous person in my lab once said, and I think is really critical. There are no women in science. And the reason that we have this uh, seminar today and this whole series of, of seminars is because we don't actually see the fact that there are people in science. There shouldn't be a saying talking about women or men in science, but you should stop thinking about it that way and think of people in science. That's what Nasi Papuzzi said, and it resonates very strongly with me. And I wish one day we would adopt this saying and forget about uh, you know, diversity and inequalities because this would be a problem solved. Thank you very much for your attention. I can take questions.